Chapter Twenty Two of the Lone Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. The Lone Wolf by Louis Joseph Vance. Chapter Twenty Two Trapped. It was a sound so slight, so very small and still, that only a super subtle sense of hearing could have discriminated it from the confused multiplicity of almost inaudible, interwoven, interdependent sounds that make up the slumberous quiet of every human habitation by night. Lanyard, whose training had taught him how to listen, had learned that the nocturnal hush of each and every house has its singular cadence its own gentle movement of muted but harmonious sound, in which the introduction of an alien sound produces immediate discord, and to which, while at his work, he need attend only subconsciously, since the least variation from the norm would give him warning. Now, in the silence of this old mansion, he detected a faint flutter of discordance that sounded a note of stealth, such a note as no move of his since entering had evoked. He was no longer alone, but shared the empty magnificence of those vast salons with one whose purpose was as furtive, as secret, as wary as his own. No servant or watchman roused by an intuition of evil, but one who had no more than he any lawful business there. And while he stood at alert attention, the sound was repeated from a point less distant, indicating that the second intruder was moving toward the library. In two swift strides, Lanyard left the shelter of the screen and took to cover in the recess of one of the tall windows, behind its heavy velvet hangings, an action that could have been timed no more precisely had it been rehearsed. He was barely in hiding when a shape of shadow slipped into the library, paused beside the massive desk, and raked the room with the light of a powerful flash lamp. Its initial glare struck squarely into Lanyard's eyes, dazzling them as he peered through a narrow opening in the portieres, and, though the light was instantly shifted, for several moments a blur of peacock color, blending, ebbing, hung like a curtain in the darkness, and he could see nothing distinctly, only the trail traced by that dancing spotlight over walls and furnishings. When at length his vision cleared, the newcomer was kneeling in turn before the safe, but more light was needed and this one, lacking Lanyard's patience and studious caution, turned back to the desk, and, taking the reading lamp, transferred it to the floor behind the screen. But, even before the flood of light followed the dull click of the switch, Lanyard had recognized the woman. For an instant he felt dazed, half-stunned, suffocating, much as he had felt with Greg's fingers tightening on his windpipe that weak old night at Troyon's. He experienced real difficulty about breathing, and was conscious of a sickish throbbing in his temples, and a pounding in his bosom like the tolling of a great bell. He stared, swaying. The light, gushing from the opaque hood, made the safe door a glare, and was thrown back into her intent, masked face, throwing out in sharp silhouette her lithe, sweet body, indisputably identified by the individual poise of her head and shoulders, and the gracious contours of her tailored coat. She was all in black, even to her hands, no trace of white or any color showing but the fair curve of the cheek below her mask, and the red of her lips and if more evidence were needed, the intelligence with which she attacked the combination, the confident, business-like precision distinguishing her every action, proved her an apt pupil in that business. His thoughts were all in a welter of miserable confusion. He knew that this explained many things he would have held questionable, had not his infatuation forbidden him to consider them at all, lest he be disloyal to this woman whom he adored but in the anguish of that moment he could entertain but one thought, and that possessed him altogether, that she must somehow be saved from the evil she contemplated. But while he hesitated, she became sensitive to his presence, though he had made no sound since her entrance, though he had not even stirred, somehow she divined that he, someone, was there in the recess of the window, watching her. 
In the act of opening the safe, using the memorandum of its combination which he had jotted down in her presence, he saw her pause, freeze to a pose of attention, then turn to stare directly at the portier that hid him. And for an eternal second she remained kneeling there, so still that she seemed not even to breathe, her gaze fixed and level, waiting for some sound, some sign, some tremor of the curtain's folds to confirm her suspicion. When at length she rose, it was in one swift, alert movement, and as she paused with her slight shoulders squared, and her head thrown back defiantly, challengingly, as one without will of his own, but drawn irresistibly by her gaze, he stepped out into the room. And since he was no more the lone wolf, but now a simple man in agony, with no thought for their circumstances, for the fact that they were both housebreakers, and that the slightest sound might raise a hue and cry upon them, he took one faltering step toward her, stopped, lifted a hand in a gesture of appeal, and stammered, "'Lucy, you?' His voice broke and failed. She didn't answer, more than by recoiling as though he had offered to strike her, until the table stopped her and she leaned back as if glad of its support. "'Oh!' she cried, trembling. "'Why, why, did you do it?' He might have answered her in kind, but self-justification passed his power. He couldn't say, "'Because this evening you made me lose faith in everything, and I thought to forget you by going to the devil the quickest way I knew, this way.' Though that was true. He couldn't say, because, a thief from boyhood, habit proved too strong for me, and I couldn't withstand temptation. For that was untrue. He could only hang his head and mumble the wretched confession, I don't know. As if he hadn't spoken, she cried again, Why, why did you do it? I was so proud of you, so sure of you, the man who had turned straight because of me. It compensated, but now... Her voice broke in a short, dry sob. "'Compensated?' he repeated stupidly. "'Yes, compensated!' She lifted her head with a gesture of impatience. "'For this, don't you understand, for this that I'm doing. You don't imagine I'm here of my own will, that I went back to Bannon for any reason but to try to save you from him. I knew something of his power, and you didn't. I knew if I went away with you, he'd never rest until he had you murdered. And I thought if I could mislead him by lies for a little time, long enough to give you a chance to escape, I thought, perhaps, I might be able to communicate with the police, denounce him. She hesitated, breathless and appealing. At her first words, he had drawn close to her, and all their talk was murmurings. But this was quite instinctive, for both were beyond considerations of prudence, the one coherent thought of each being that now, once and forever, all misunderstanding must be done away with. Now, as naturally as though they had been lovers always, Lanyard took her hand and clasped it between his own. "'You cared as much as that. I love you.' she told him. I love you so much I am ready to sacrifice everything for you. Life, liberty, honor. Hush, dearest, hush, he begged, half distracted. I mean it. If honor could hold me back, do you think I would have broken in here tonight to steal for Bannon? He sent you, eh? Lanyard commented in a dangerous voice. He was too cunning for me. I was afraid to tell you. I meant to tell, to warn you, this evening in the cab, but then I thought, perhaps, if I said nothing and sent you away believing the worst of me, perhaps you would save yourself and forget me. But never. I tried my best to deceive him, but couldn't. They got the truth from me by threats. They wouldn't dare. They dare anything, I tell you. They knew enough of what had happened through their spies to go on, and they tormented and bullied me until I broke down and told them everything. And when they learned you had brought the jewels back here, Bannon told me I must bring them to him, that if I refused, he'd have you killed. I held out until tonight. Then, just as I was about to go to bed, he received a telephone message and told me you were driving a taxi and followed by Apaches and wouldn't live till daylight 
if I persisted in refusing. You came alone? No, three men brought me to the gate. They're waiting outside, in the park. Apaches? Two of them. The other is Captain Ekstrom. Ekstrom! Lanyard cried in despair. Is he... The dull, heavy crashing slam of the great front doors silenced him. End of chapter 22 Recording by William Tomko Chapter 23 of The Lone Wolf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by William Tomko the Lone Wolf by Louis Joseph Vance, Chapter Twenty Three, Madame Omber. Before the echo of that crash ceased to reverberate from room to room, Lanyard slipped to one side of the doorway, from which point he could command the perspective of the salons together with a partial view of the front doors, and he was no more than there in the shadow of the portieres when light from an electrolier flooded the reception hall. It showed him a single figure, that of a handsome woman, considerably beyond middle age, but still a well-poised, vigorous, and commanding presence, in full evening dress of such magnificence as to suggest recent attendance at some state function. Standing beneath the light, she was restoring a key to a brocaded handbag. This done, she turned her head and spoke indistinguishably over her shoulder. Promptly there came into view a second woman of about the same age, but even more strong and able of appearance, a serving woman, in plain, dark garments, undoubtedly Madame's maid. Handing over the brocaded bag, Madame unlatched the throat of her ermine cloak and surrendered it to the servant's care. Her next words were audible, and reassuring in as far as they indicated ignorance of anything amiss. "'Thank you, Sidonie. You may go to bed now.' Madame will not need me to undress her? I'm not ready yet. When I am, I'm old enough to take care of myself. Besides, I prefer you to go to bed, Sidonie. It doesn't improve your temper to lose your beauty sleep. Many thanks, Madame. Good night. Good night. The maid moved off toward the main staircase, while her mistress turned deliberately through the salons toward the library. At this, swinging back to the girl in a stride and grasping her wrist to compel attention, Lanyard spoke in a rapid whisper, mouth close to her ear, but his solicitude so unselfish and so intense that for the moment he was altogether unconscious of either her allure or his passion. This way, he said, imperatively drawing her toward the window by which he had entered. There's a balcony outside, a short drop to the ground, and unlatching the window, he urged her through it. Try to leave by the back gateway, the one I showed you before, avoiding Ekstrom. But surely you are coming too, she insisted, hanging back. Impossible. There's no time for us both to escape undetected. I shall keep Madame interested only long enough for you to get away. But take this, and he pressed his automatic into her hand. No, take it. I've another, he lied, and you may need it. Don't fear for me, but go. Oh, my heart! Go! The footfalls of Madame Omber were sounding dangerously near, and without giving the girl more opportunity to protest, Lanyard closed the windows, shot the latch, and stole like a cat round the farther side of the desk, pausing within a few feet of the screen and safe. The desk lamp was still burning where the girl had left it behind the cinnabar screen, and Lanyard knew that the difficulties of its rays was enough to render his figure distinctly and immediately visible to one entering the doorway. Now everything hung upon the temper of the householder, whether she would take that apparition quietly, deceived by Lanyard's mumming into believing she had only a poor thievish fool to deal with, or with a storm or bourgeois hysteria. In the latter event, Lanyard's hand was ready planted, palm down, on the top of the desk, should the woman attempt to give the alarm, a single bound would carry the adventurer across it in full flight for the front doors. In the doorway, the mistress of the house appeared and halted, her quick, bright eyes shifting from the light on the floor to the dark figure of the thief. Then, in a stride, she found a switch and turned on the chandelier, a blaze of light. 
As this happened, Lanyard cowered, lifting an elbow as though to guard his face, as though expecting to find himself under the muzzle of a revolver. The gesture had the calculated effect of focusing the attention of the woman exclusively to him, after one swift glance round had shown her a room tenanted only by herself and a cringing thief. And immediately it was made manifest that, whether or not deceived, she meant to take the situation quietly, if in a strong hand. Her eyes narrowed, and the muscles of her square, almost masculine jaw hardened ominously as she looked the intruder up and down. Then a flicker of contempt modified the grimness of her countenance. She took three steps forward, pausing on the other side of the desk, her back to the doorway. Lanyard trembled visibly. "'Well!' the word boomed like the opening gun of an engagement. "'Well, my man!' The shrewd eyes swerved to the closed door of the safe, and quickly back again. "'You don't seem to have accomplished much.' "'For God's sake, madame,' Lanyard blurted in a husky, shaken voice, "'nothing like his own. Don't have me arrested. Give me a chance. I haven't taken anything. Don't call the flicks.' He checked, moving an uncertain hand towards his throat, as if his tongue had gone dry. "'Come, come,' the woman answered, with a look almost of pity. "'I haven't called anyone. As yet.' The fingers of one strong white hand were drumming gently on the top of the desk. Then, with a movement so quick and sure that Lanyard himself could hardly have bettered it, they slipped down to a handle of a drawer, jerked it open, closed round the butt of a revolver, and presented it at the adventurer's head. Automatically he raised both hands. "'Don't shoot!' he cried. "'I'm not armed!' "'Is that the truth?' "'You've only to search me, madame.' "'Thanks,' madame's accents now discovered a trace of dry humor. "'I'll leave that to you. Turn out your pockets on the desk there, and remember, I'll stand no nonsense.' The weapon covered Lanyard steadily, leaving him no choice but to obey. As it happened, he was glad of the excuse to listen for sounds to tell how the girl was faring in her flight, and made a pretense of trembling fingers cover the slowness with which he complied. But he heard nothing. When he had visibly turned every pocket inside out, and their contents lay upon the desk, the woman looked the exhibits over incuriously. "'Put them back,' she said curtly, "'and then fetch that chair over there, the one in the corner. I've a notion I'd like to talk to you.' That's the usual thing, isn't it? How? Lanyard demanded with a vacant stare. In all the criminal novels I've ever read, the law-abiding householder always sits down and has a sociable chat with the housebreaker before calling in the police. I'm afraid that's part of the price you've got to pay for my hospitality. She paused, eyeing Lanyard inquisitively, while he restored his belongings to his pockets. Now, get that chair! she ordered, and waited, standing, until she had been obeyed. That's it. There. Sit down. Leaning against the desk, her revolver held negligently, the speaker favored Lanyard with a more leisurely inspection. The harshness of her stare was softened, and the anger which at first had darkened her countenance was gone by the time she chose to pursue her catechism. What's your name? No, don't answer. I saw your eyes waver, and I'm not interested in a makeshift alias. But it's the stock question, you know. Do you care for a cigar? She opened a mahogany humidor on the desk. No, thanks. Right, according to Hoyle. The criminal always refuses to smoke in these scenes. But let's forget the book and write our own lines. I'll ask you an original question. Why were you acting just now? Acting? Lanyard repeated, intrigued by the acuteness of this masterful woman's mentality. Precisely, pretending you were a common thief. For a moment you actually made me think you were afraid of me, but you're neither the one nor the other. How do I know? Because you're unarmed. Your voice has changed in the last two minutes to that of a cultivated man. You've stopped cringing and started thinking, and the way you walked across the floor and handled that chair showed how powerfully you're made. If I didn't have this revolver, you could overpower me in an instant, and I'm no weakling, as women go. So, why the acting? Studying his captor with narrow interest, Lanyard smiled faintly and shrugged, but made no answer. He could do no more than this, no more than spare for time. 
The longer he indulged Madame in her whim, the better Lucy's chances of scot-free escape. By this time, he reckoned, she would have found her way through the service gate to the street. But he was on edge with unending apprehension of mischance. "'Come, come,' Madame Omber insisted. "'You're hardly civil, my man. Answer my question.' "'You don't expect me to, do you?' Why not? You owe me at least satisfaction of my curiosity, in return for breaking into my house. But if, as you suggest, I am, or was, acting with a purpose, why expect me to give the show away? That's logic. I knew you could think. More's the pity. Pity I can think? Pity you can get your own consent to waste yourself like this. I'm an old woman, and I know men better than most. I can see ability in you. So I say, it's a pity you won't use yourself to better advantage. Don't misunderstand me. This isn't the conventional act. I don't hold with encouraging a fool in his folly. You're a fool, for all your intelligence, and the only cure I can see for you is drastic punishment. Meaning the santé, madame? Quite so. I tell you frankly, when I'm finished lecturing you, off you go to prison. If that's the case, I don't see I stand to gain much by retailing the history of my life. This seems to be your cue to ring for servants to call the police. A trace of anger shone in the woman's eyes. You're right, she said shortly. I dare say Sidoni isn't asleep yet. I'll get her to telephone while I keep an eye on you. Bending over the desk, without removing her gaze from the adventurer, his captor groped for, found, and pressed a call button. From some remote quarter of the house sounded the grumble of an electric bell. "'Pity you're so brazen,' she observed. "'Just a little less side, and you'd be a rather engaging person.' Lanyard made no reply. In fact, he wasn't listening. Under the strain of that suspense, the iron control which had always been his was breaking down, since now it was for another he was concerned, and he wasted no strength trying to enforce it. The stress of his anxiety was both undisguised and undisguisable, nor did Madame Omber overlook it. "'What's the trouble, eh? Is it that already you hear the cell door clang in your ears?' As she spoke, Lanyard left his chair with a movement in the execution of which all his wits cooperated, with a spring as lithe and sure and swift as an animal's that carried him like a shot across the two yards or so between them. The slightest error in his reckoning would have finished him, for the other had been watching for just such a move, and the revolver was nearly level with Lanyard's head when he grasped it by the barrel, turned that to the ceiling, imprisoned the woman's wrist with his other hand, and in two movements had captured the weapon without injuring its owner. "'Don't be alarmed,' he said quietly. "'I'm not going to do anything more violent than to put this weapon out of commission.' Breaking it smartly, he shot a shower of cartridges to the door, and tossed the now useless weapon into a wastebasket beneath the desk. "'Hope I didn't hurt you,' he added abstractedly. "'But your pistol was in my way.' He took a stride toward the door, pulled up, and hung in hesitation, frowning absently at the woman, who, without moving, laughed quietly and watched him with a twinkle of malicious diversion." He repaid this with a stare of thoughtful appraisal. From the first he had recognized in her a character of uncommon tolerance and amiability. "'Pardon, madam, but,' he began abruptly, and checked in constrained appreciation of his impudence. "'If that's permission to interrupt your reverie,' Madame Omber remarked, "'I don't mind telling you. You're the most extraordinary burglar I ever heard of.' Footfalls became audible on the staircase, the hasty scuffling of slippered feet. "'Is that you, Sidonie?' Madame called. The voice of the maid replied, "'Yes, Madame, coming. Well, don't. Just yet. Not till I call you.' "'Very good, Madame.' The woman returned complete attention to Lanyard. "'Now, Monsieur of Two Minds, what is it you wish to say to me?' "'Why did you do that?' the adventurer asked, with a jerk of his head toward the hall. "'Tell Sidonie to wait, instead of calling for help? "'Because, well, because you interest me strangely. "'I've got a theory you're in a desperate quandary, "'and are about to throw yourself on my mercy.' "'You are right,' Lanyard admitted tersely. "'Ah, now you do begin to grow interesting. 
Would you mind explaining why you think I'll be merciful? Because, madame, I've done you a great service, and feel I can count upon your gratitude. The Frenchwoman's eyebrows lifted at this. Doubtless monsieur knows what he's talking about. Listen, madame, I am in love with a young woman, an American, a stranger, and friendless in Paris. If anything happens to me tonight, if I am arrested or assassinated, is that likely? Quite likely, madame. I have enemies among the Apaches, and in my own profession as well, and I have reason to believe that several of them are in this neighborhood tonight. I may possibly not escape their attentions. In that event, this young lady of whom I speak will need a protector. And why must I interest myself in her fate, pray? Because, madame, of this service I have done you. Recently, in London, you were robbed. The woman started and colored with excitement. You know something of my jewels? Everything, madame. It was I who stole them. You? You are, then, that lone wolf? I was, madame. Why the past tense? The woman demanded, eyeing him with a portentous frown. Because I am done with thieving. She threw back her head and laughed, but without mirth. A likely story, monsieur. Have you reformed since I caught you here? Does it matter when? I take it that proof, visible, tangible proof of my sincerity, more than a meaningless date, would be needed to convince you. No doubt of that, monsieur, the lone wolf. Could you ask better proof than the restoration of your stolen property? Are you trying to bribe me to let you off with an offer to return my jewels? I'm afraid emergency reformation wouldn't persuade you. You may well be afraid, monsieur. But if I can prove I've already restored your jewels. But you have not. If madame will do me the favor to open her safe, she will find them there conspicuously placed. What nonsense! Am I wrong in assuming that madame didn't return from England until quite recently? But today, in fact. And you haven't troubled to investigate your safe since returning? It had not occurred to me. Then why not test my statement before denying it? With an incredulous shrug, Madame Amber terminated a puzzled scrutiny of Lanyard's countenance and turned to the safe. But to have done what you declare you have, she argued, you must have known the combination, since it appears you haven't broken this open. The combination ran glibly off Lanyard's tongue, and at this, with every evidence of excitement, at length beginning to hope, if not to believe, the woman set herself to open the safe. Within a minute she had succeeded. The Morocco-bound jewel case was in her hand, and a hasty examination had assured her its treasure was intact. But why, she stammered, pale with emotion, why, monsieur, why? Because I decided to leave off stealing for a livelihood. When did you bring these jewels here? Within the week, four or five nights since, and then repented, eh? I own it but came here again to-night to steal a second time what you had stolen once. That's true, too. And I interrupted you. Pardon, madame, not you, but my better self. I came to steal. I could not. Monsieur, you do not convince. I fail to fathom your motives, but— a sudden shock of heavy trampling feet in the reception hall, accompanied by a clash of excited voices, silenced her and brought Lanyard instantly to the face about. Above that loud wrangle, of which neither had received the least warning, so completely had their argument absorbed them, Sidonie's accents were audible. "'Madame! Madame!' a cry of protest. "'What is it?' Madame demanded of Lanyard. He threw her the word, "'Police!' as he turned and flung himself into the recess of the window." but when he wrenched it open the voice of a picket on the lawn saluted him in sharp warning and when involuntarily he stepped out upon the balcony a flash of flame split the gloom below a loud report rang in the quiet of the park and a bullet slapped viciously the stone facing of the window end of chapter twenty three recording by william tomko Chapter 24 of The Lone Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lone Wolf by Louis Joseph Vance. 
Chapter Twenty Four: The Rendezvous. With as little ceremony as though the bullet had lodged in himself, Lanyard tumbled back into the room, tripped, and fell sprawling, while to a tune of clattering boots, two sergeants de ville lumbered valiantly into the library and pulled up to discover Madame Omber standing calmly, safe and sound, beside her desk, and Lanyard picking himself up from the floor by the open window. Beside them, Sidonie trotted, wringing her hands. Madam, she bleated, they wouldn't listen to me, madam. I couldn't stop them. All right, Sidonie, go back to the hall. I'll call you when needed. Messieurs, good morning. One of the sergeants advanced with an uncertain salute and a superfluous question. Madame Omber? The other waited on the threshold, barring the way. Lanyard measured the two speculatively. The spokesman seemed a bit old and fat, ripe for his pension, little apt to prove seriously effective in a rough and tumble. But the other was young, sturdy, and broad-chested, with the poise of an athlete, and carried in addition to his sword a pistol naked in his hand, while his clear blue eyes, meeting the adventurers, lighted up with a glint of invitation. For the present, however, Lanyard wasn't taking any. He met that challenge with a look of utter stupidity, folded his arms, lounged against the desk, and watched Madame Umber acknowledge, none too cordially, the other sergeant's query. I am Madame Umber, yes. What can I do for you? The sergeant gaped. Pardon, he stammered, then laughed as one who tardily appreciates a joke. It is well we are arrived in town, madam, he added, though it would seem you have not had great trouble with this miscreant. Where is the woman? He moved a pace toward Lanyard, handcuffs jiggled in his grasp. But a moment, madame interposed. Woman? What woman? Pausing, the older sergeant explained in a tone of surprise, but his accomplice, naturally. Such were our instructions, to proceed at once to madame's hotel, come in quietly by the servant's entrance, which would be open, and arrest a burglar with his female accomplice. Again the stout sergeant moved towards Lanyard. Again Madame Umber stopped him. But one more moment, if you please. Her eyes, dense with suspicion, questioned Lanyard, who, with a significant nod towards the jewel case still in her hands, gave her a glance of dumb entreaty. After a brief hesitation, it is a mistake, Madame declared. There is no woman in this house, to my certain knowledge, who has no right to be here. But you say you received a message? I sent none. The fat sergeant shrugged. That is not for me to dispute, madam. I have only my orders to go by. He glared sullenly at Lanyard, who returned a placid smile that, despite such hope as he might derive from madame's irresolute manner, masked a vast amount of trepidation. He felt tolerably sure madame Omber had not sent for police on prior knowledge of his presence in the library. All this, then, would seem to indicate a new form of attack on the part of the pack. He had probably been followed and seen to enter, or else the girl had been caught attempting to steal away, and the information wrung from her by force majeure. Moreover, he could hear two more pairs of feet tramping through the salon. Pending the arrival of these last, Madame Omber said nothing more. And, ceremoniously enough, the newcomer shouldered into the library, one pompous uniformed body, of otherwise undistinguished appearance, promptly identified by the sergeant de ville as Monsieur la Commissaire of that quarter. The other, a puffy mediocrity, known to Lanyard at least, if apparently to no one else, as Popinot. At this confirmation of his darkest fears, the adventurer abandoned hope of aid from Madame Omber, and began quietly to reckon his chances of escape through his own efforts. But he was quite unarmed, and the odds were heavy. Four against one, all four no doubt under arms, and two, at least, the sergeants, men of sound military training. Madame Omber, inquired the commissionaire, saluting that lady with immense dignity, one trust that this intrusion may be pardoned, the circumstances remembered. In an affair of this nature, involving this repository of so historic treasures, that is quite well understood, Monsieur le Commissaire, Madame replied distantly, and this Monsieur is, no doubt, your aid? Pardon, the official hastened to identify his companion, Monsieur Papinot, agent de la Sûreté, who lays these informations. With a profound obeisance to Madame Omber, Papinot strode dramatically over to confront Lanyard, and explore his features with his small, keen, shifty eyes of a pig, a scrutiny which the adventurer suffered with superficial calm. It is he, Popinot announced with a gesture. Messieurs, I call upon you to arrest this man, Michael Lanyard, alias the Lone Wolf. He stepped back a pace, expanding his chest in vain effort to eclipse his abdomen, and glanced triumphantly at his respectful audience. Accused, he added with intense relish, of the murder of Inspector Roddy of Scotland Yard at Troyon's, as well as of setting fire to that establishment. For this, Papineau, Lanyard interrupted in undertone, I shall some day cut off your ears. He turned to Madame Umber. Accept, if you please, madam, my sincere regrets. 
but this charge happens to be one of which I am altogether innocent. Instantly, from lounging against the desk, Lanyard straightened up, and the heavy humidor of brass and mahogany, on which his right hand had been resting, seemed fairly to leap from its place as, with a sweep of his arm, he sent it spinning point-blank at the younger sergeant. Before that one, wholly unprepared, could more than gasp, the humidor caught him a blow like a kick just below the breastbone. He reeled. The breath left him in one great gust. He sat down abruptly, blue eyes wide with a look of grieved surprise, clapped both hands to his middle, blinked, turned pale, and keeled over on his side. But Lanyard hadn't waited to no results. He was busy. The fat sergeant had leaped snarling upon his arm, and was struggling to hold it still long enough to snap a handcuff round the wrist, while the commissionaire had started forward with a bellow of rage, and two hands extended in itching for the adventurer's throat. The first received a half-armed jab on the point of his chin that jarred his entire system, and without in the least understanding how it happened, found himself rolled around and laid prostrate in the commissionaire's path. The latter tripped, fell, and planted two hard knees, with the bulk of his weight atop them, on the apex of the sergeant's paunch. At the same time, Lanyard, leaping towards the doorway, noticed Popinot tugging at something in his hip pocket. Followed a vivid flash, then complete darkness. With a well-aimed kick, an elementary movement of La Savant, Lanyard had dislocated the switch of the electric lights, knocking its porcelain box from the wall, breaking the connection, and creating a short circuit which extinguished every light in that part of the house. With his way thus apparently cleared, the police in confusion, darkness aiding him, Lanyard plunged on, but in mid-stride as he crossed the threshold, his ankle was caught by the still prostrate younger sergeant and jerked from under him. His momentum threw him with a crash, and may have spared him a worse mishap, for in the same breath he heard the report of a pistol and knew that Popinot had fired at his fugitive shadow. As he brought one heel down with crushing force on the sergeant's wrist, freeing his foot, he was dimly conscious of the voice of the commissionaire shouting frantic prayer to cease firing. Then the pain-maddened sergeant crawled to his knees, lunged blindly forward, knocked the adventurer back in the act of rising, and fell on top of him. Hampered by two hundred pounds of fighting Frenchmen, Lanyard felt his cause was lost, yet battled on, and would while breath was in him. With a heave, a twist, and a squirm, he slipped from under, and swinging a fist at random, barked his knuckles against the mouth of the sergeant. Momentarily that one relaxed his hold, and Lanyard struggled to his knees, only to go down as the indomitable Frenchman grappled yet a second time. Now, however, as they fell, Lanyard was on top, and shifting both hands to his antagonist's left forearm, he wrenched it up and around. There was a cry of pain, and he jumped clear of one no longer to be reckoned with. Nevertheless, as he had feared, the delay had proved ruinous. He had only found his feet when an unidentified person hurled himself bodily through the gloom and wrapped his hands around Lanyard's thighs and as both went down, two more piled on top. For the next minute or two, Lanyard fought blindly, madly, viciously, striking and kicking at random. For all that, even with one sergeant hoard the combat, they were three to one, and though with the ferocity of sheer desperation he shook them all off at one time and gained a few yards more, it was only again to be overcome and borne down, crushed beneath the weight of three. His wind was going, his strength was leaving him. He mustered up every ounce of energy, all his wit and courage, for one last effort, fought like a cat, tooth and nail, toiled once more to his knees, with two clinging to him like wolves to the flanks of a stag, shook one off, regained his feet, swayed, and in one final gust of ferocity dashed both fists repeatedly into the face of him who still clung to him. That one was Popano. He knew instinctively that this was so, and a grim joy filled him as he felt the man's clutches relax and fall away, and guessed how brutal was the damage he had done to that fat, evil face. At length free, he made off, running, stumbling, reeling, gained the hall, flung open the door, and heedless of the picket who had fired on him from below the window, dashed down the steps, and away. Three shots sped him through that intricate tangle of night-bound park, but all went wide. The pursuit, what little there was, blundered off at haphazard, and lost itself as well. He came to the wall, crept along in shelter of its shadow, until he found a tree with low-swung branch that jutted out over the street, climbed this, edged out over the wall, and dropped to the sidewalk. A shout from the quarter of the carriage gates greeted his appearance. He turned and ran again. Flying footsteps for a time pursued him, and once, with a sinking heart, he heard the rumble of a motor. But he recovered quickly, regained his wind, and ran well, with long, steady, ground-consuming strides, and he doubled, turned, and twisted in a manner to wake the envy of the most subtle fox. In time he felt warranted in slowing down to a rapid walk. Weariness was now a heavy burden upon him, and his spirit numb with desperate need of rest, but his pace did not flag, nor his purpose falter from its goal. It was a long walk, if a direct one, to which he set himself, as soon as confident the pursuit had failed once more. He plodded on, without faltering, to the one place where he might feel sure of finding his beloved, if she lived and were free. He knew that she had not forgotten, and in his heart he knew that she would never again of her own will fail him. 
nor had she. When, weary and spent from that heartbreaking climb up the merciless acclivity of the Butte Montmartre, he staggered rather than walked past the sleepy verger and found his way through the crowding shadows to the softly luminous heart of the basilica of the Sacre Coeur, he found her there, kneeling, her head bowed upon hands resting on the back of the chair before her, a slight and timid figure, lost and lonely in the long ranks of empty chairs that filled the nave. Slowly, almost fearfully, he went to her, and silently he slipped into the chair by her side. She knew, without looking up, that it was he. After a little, her hand stole out, closed round his fingers, and drew him forward with a gentle, insistent pressure. He knelt then with her, hand in hand, filled with the wonder of it, that he to whom religion had been nothing should have been brought to this by a woman's hand. He knelt for a long time, for many minutes, profoundly intrigued, his somber gaze questioning the golden shadows and the ancient mystery of the distant choir and shining altar. And there was no question in his heart but that, whatever should ensue of this, the unquiet spirit of the lone wolf was forevermore at rest. End of chapter 24 Recording by Todd Chapter 25 of The Lone Wolf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lone Wolf by Louis-Joseph Vance Chapter 25 Wings of the Morning About half-past six, Lanyard left the dressing room assigned him in the barracks of Port Aviation and waddling quaintly in the heavy wind-resisting garment supplied him at the insistence of Ducroy, made his way between the two hangars towards the practice field. Now the eastern skies were pulsing with fitful promise of the dawn, but within the vast enclosure of the aerodrome the gloom of light lingered so stubbornly that two huge searchlights had been pressed into the service of those engaged in tuning up the motor of the Parrot biplane. In the intense, white, concentrated glare that rippled oddly upon the wrinkled, oily garments of the dozen or so mechanics busy about the machine, the undersides of those wide, motionless planes hung against the dark with an effect of impermanence, as though they were already afloat and needed but a breath to send them winging skyward. To one side, a number of young and keen-faced Frenchmen, officers of the Corps, were lounging and watching the preparations with alert and intelligent interest. To the other, all the majesty of Mars was incarnate in the person of Monsieur Ducroy, posing valiantly in fur-lined coat and shining top hat, while he chatted with an officer whose trim, athletic figure was well set off by his aviating uniform. As Lanyard drew near, this last brought his heels together smartly, saluted the Minister of War, and strode off towards the flying machine. Captain Valaquin informs me he will be ready to start in five minutes, Monsieur, Ducroy announced. You are in good time. And Mademoiselle, the adventurer asked, peering anxiously round. Almost immediately the girl came forward from the shadows, with a smile apologetic for the strangeness of her attire. She had donned over her street dress, an ample leather garment which enveloped her completely, buttoning tight at throat and wrists and ankles. Her small hat had been replaced by a leather helmet which left only her eyes, nose, mouth, and chin exposed, and even those were soon to be hidden by a heavy veil for protection against splattering oil. Mademoiselle is not nervous? Ducroy inquired politely. Lucy smiled brightly. I? Why should I be, monsieur? I trust Mademoiselle will permit me to commend her courage. But pardon, I have one last word for the ears of Captain Villequin. Lifting his hat, the Frenchman joined the group near the machine. Lanyard stared unaffectedly at the girl, unable to disguise his wonder at the high spirits advertised by her rekindled color and brilliant eyes. Well, she demanded gaily, don't tell me I don't look like a fright. I know I do. I daren't tell you how you look to me, Lanyard replied soberly, but I will say this, that for sheer downright pluck, you... Thank you, monsieur. And you... He glanced with a deprecatory smile at the flimsy-looking contrivance to which they were presently to entrust their lives. Somehow, said he doubtfully, I don't feel in the least upset or exhilarated. It seems little out of the average run of life, all in a day's work. I think, she said judgmental, that you're very like the other lone wolf, the fictitious one, Lupin, you know, a bit of a blagger. If you're not nervous, why keep glancing over there? As if you were rather expecting somebody? As if you wouldn't be surprised to see Popinot, or the Mobahen pop out of the ground, or Ekstrom. Hmm, he said gravely. I don't mind telling you now that's precisely what I am afraid of. Nonsense, the girl cried out in open contempt. What could they do? Please don't ask me, Lanyard begged seriously. I might try to tell you. But don't worry, my dear. Fugitively, her hand touched his. We're ready. It was true enough. 
De Croix was moving impressively back towards them. All is prepared, he announced in sonorous accents. A bit sobered, in silence, they approached the machine. Valaquin kept himself aloof while Lanyard and a young officer helped the girl to the seat to the right of the pilot and strapped her in. When Lanyard had been similarly secured in the place on the left, the two sat, imprisoned, some six feet above the ground. Lanyard found his perch comfortable enough. A broad band of webbing furnished support for his back, another crossed his chest by way of provision against forward pitching. There were rests for his feet, and for his hands cloth-wound grips fixed to struts on either side. He smiled at Lucy across the empty seat, and was surprised at the clearness with which her answering smile was visible. But he wasn't to see it again for a long and weary time. Almost immediately she began to adjust her veil. The morning had grown much lighter within the past few minutes. A long wait ensued, during which the swarm of mechanics, assistants, and military aviators buzzed round their feet like bees. The sun was now pale to the western horizon. A fleet of heavy clouds was drifting off into the south, leaving in their wake thin veils of mist that promised soon to disappear before the rays of the sun. The air seemed tolerably clear and not unseasonably cold. The light grew stronger still. Features of distant objects defined themselves. Traces of color warmed the winter landscape. At length, their pilot, wearing his wind mask, appeared and began to climb to his perch. With a cool knock on Lanyard and a civil bow to his woman passenger, he settled himself, adjusted several levers, and flirted a gay hand to his brother officers. There was a warning cry. The crowd dropped back rapidly to either side. Ducroy lifted his hat in parting salute, cried bon voyage, and scuttled clear like a startled rooster before a motor car. And the motor and propeller broke loose with a mighty roar comparable only, in Lanyard's fancy, to the chant of ten thousand riveting locusts. He felt momentarily as if his eardrums must burst with the incessant and tremendous concussions registered upon them, but presently this sensation passed, leaving him with that of permanent deafness. Before he could recover and regain control of his startled wits, the aviator had thrown down a lever, and the great fabric was in motion. It swept down the field like a frightened swan, and the wheels of its chassis, registering every infinitesimal irregularity in the surface of the ground, magnified them all a hundredfold. It was like riding in a tumble, driven at top speed over the giant's causeway. Lanyard was shaken violently to the very marrow of his bones. He believed that even his eyes must be rattling in their sockets. Then the parrot began to ascend. Singularly enough, this change was marked, at first, by no more than slight lessening of the vibration. Still, the machine seemed to be dashing over a cobbled thoroughfare at breakneck speed, and Lanyard found it difficult to appreciate that they were afloat, even when he looked down and discovered a hundred feet of space between himself and the practice field. In another breath, they were soaring over housetops. Momentarily, now, the shocks became less frequent, and presently they ceased almost altogether, to be repeated only at rare intervals, when the drift of air opposing the planes developed irregularities in its velocity. There succeeded, in contrast, the sublimest peace. Even the roaring of the propeller dwindled to a sustainable drone. The biplane seemed to float without an effort upon a vast, still sea, flawed only occasionally by inconsiderable ripples. Still rising, they surprised the earliest rays of the sun, and in their virgin light the aeroplane was transformed into a thing of gossamer gold. Continually, the air buffeted their faces like a flood of icy water. Below, the scroll of the world unrolled like some vast and intricately illuminated missile, or like some strange mosaic, marvelously minute. Lignard could see the dial of the compass, fixed to a strut on the pilot's left. By that telltale, their course lay nearly due northeast. Already, the weltering roofs of Paris were in sight. On the right, the Eiffel Tower spearing up like a fairy pillar of gold lacework, the same looping the cluttered acres like a sleek brown serpent, the Sacre Coeur a dream palace of opalescent walls. Versailles broke the horizon to port and slipped astern. Paris closed up, telescoped its panorama, became a mere blur, a smoky smudge. But it was long before the distance eclipsed that admonitory finger of the Eiffel. Valaquin manipulating the levers, the plane tilted its nose and swam higher and yet higher. The song of the motor dropped an octave to a richer tone. The speed was sensibly increased. Lanyard contemplated with untempered wonder the fact of his equanimity. There seemed nothing at all strange in this extraordinary experience. He was by no means excited, remained merely, if deeply interested. And he could detect in his physical sensations no trace of that qualmish dread he had always experienced in high places. The sense he had of security, of solidity, was and ever remained wholly unaccountable in his understanding. Of a sudden, surprised by a touch on his arm, he turned to see through the Michael windows of the wind mask the eyes of the aviator informed with importunate doubt. Infinitely mystified, and so an easy prey to sickening fear lest something were going wrong with the machine, Lanyard shook his head to indicate lack of comprehension. With an impatient gesture, the aviator pointed downward. 
Appreciating the fact that speech was impossible, Lanyard clutched the struts and bent forward. But the pace was now so fast, and their elevation so great, that the landscape swimming below his vision was no more than a brownish plain figuratively maculated with blots of contrasting color. He looked up blankly, but only to be treated to the same gesture. Peaked, he concentrated attention more closely upon the flat, streaming landscape, and suddenly he recognized something oddly familiar in an approaching bend of the Seine. saint germain en laye he exclaimed with a start of alarm. This was the danger point. And over there, he reminded himself, to the left, that wide field with a queer white thing in the middle that looks like a winged grub, that must be de Morbihan's aerodrome and his Vercar monoplane. Aren't they bringing it out? Is that what Veliquin means? And if so, what of it? I don't see... Sudden doubt and wonder chilled the adventurer. Temporarily, Valaquin returned entire attention to the management of the biplane. The wind was now blowing more fitfully, creating pockets, those holes in the air so dreaded by cloud pilots, and in quest of more constant resistance, the aviator was swinging his craft in a wide northerly curve, climbing ever higher and more high. The earth soon lost all semblance of design. Even the twisted silver wire of the Seine vanished, far over to the left, remained only the effect of firm suspension in that high blue vault, of a continuous flow of iced water in the face, together with the tuneless chanting of the motor. After some forty minutes of this, it may have been an hour, for time was then an incalculable thing, Lanyard, in a mood of abnormal sensitivitas, began to define additional disquiet in the mind of the aviator, and stared until he caught his eye. "'What is it?' he screamed in futile effort to raise his voice above the din. But the Frenchman understood, and responded with a sweep of his arm towards the horizon ahead, and seeing nothing but cloud in the quarter indicated, Lanyard grasped the nature of a phenomena which, from the first, had been vaguely troubling him. The reason why he had been able to perceive no real rim to the world was that the earth was all esteem from the recent heavy rains. All the more remote distances were veiled with rising vapor, and now they were approaching the coast, to which, it seemed, the mists clung closest, for all the world before them slept beneath a blanket of dull gray. Nor was it difficult now to understand why the aviator was ill at ease, facing the prospect of navigating a channel fog. Several minutes later, he startled Lanyard with another preparatory touch on his arm, followed by a significant glance over his shoulder. Lanyard turned quickly. Behind them, at a distance which he calculated roughly as two miles, the silhouette of a monoplane hung against a brilliant firmament, resembling, with its single spread of wings, more a solitary soaring gull than any man-directed mechanism. Only an infrequent and almost imperceptible shifting of the wings proved that it was moving. He watched it for several seconds, in deepening perplexity and anxiety, finding it impossible to guess whether it were gaining or losing in that long chase, or who might be its pilot. Yet he had little doubt but that the pursuing machine had risen from the aerodrome of Count Remy de Mortehan at saint germain en laye and that it was nothing less, in fact, than de Mortehan's Viker, reputed the fastest monoplane in Europe and winner of a dozen international events, and that it was guided, if not by de Mortehan himself, by one of the creatures of the pack, quite possibly, even more probably, by Exton. But, assuming all this, what evil could such pursuit portend? In what conceivable manner could the pack reckon to further its ends by commissioning the monoplane to overtake or distance the parrot? They could not hinder the escape of Lanyard and Lucy Shen to England in any way, by any means reasonably to be imagined. Was it simply one more move to keep the pair under espionage? But that might more readily have been accomplished by telegraphing or telephoning the pack's confrères, worth miners, associates in England. Lanyard gave it up admitting his inability to trump up any sane excuse for such conduct, but the riddle continued to fret his mind without respite. From the first, from that moment when Lucy's disappearance had required postponement of this flight, he had feared trouble. It hadn't seemed reasonable to hope that the parrot could be held in waiting on his convenience for many days without the secret leaking out, but it was trouble to develop before the start from port aviation that he had anticipated. The possibility that the pack would be able to work any mischief to him after that had never entered his calculations. Even now he found it difficult to give it serious consideration. Again he glanced back. Now, in his judgment, the monoplane loomed larger than before against the glowing sky, indicating that it was overtaking them. Beneath his breath, Lanyard swore from a burning heart. The parrot was capable of the speed of eighty miles an hour, and unquestionably Valaquin was wheeling every ounce of power out of his willing motor. Since drawing Lanyard's attention to the pursuer, he had brought about appreciable acceleration. But would even that pace serve to hold the Vakir, if not to distance it? His next backward glance reckoned the monoplane no nearer. And another thirty minutes or so elapsed without the relative positions of the two flying machines undergoing any perceptible change. In the course of this period, the parrot rose to an altitude, indicated by the barograph at Lanyard's elbow, of more than half a mile. Below, the channel fog spread itself out like a sea of milk, 
slowly churning. Staring down in fascination, Lanyard told himself gravely, Blue water below that, my friend. It seemed difficult to credit the fact that they had made the flight from Paris in so short a time. By his reckoning, a very rough one, the parrot was then somewhere off depth. It ought to pick up England, in such a case, not far from Brighton. If only one could see. By bending forward a little and staring past the aviator, Lanyard could catch a glimpse of Lucy Shannon. Though all her beauty and grace of person were lost in the clumsy swaddling of her makeshift costume, she seemed to be comfortable enough, and the rushing air, keen with the chill of that great altitude, molded her wind veil precisely to the exquisite contours of her face and stung her firm cheeks until they glowed with a rare fire that even that thick dark mesh could not wholly quench. The sun crept above the floor of mist, playing upon it with iridescent rays, shot it through and through with a warm pulsating glow like that of a fire opal, and suddenly turned it to a tumbled sea of gold which, apparently boundless, baffled every effort to surmise their position, whether they were above land or sea. Nonetheless, Lanyard's rough and rapid calculations persuaded him that they were then about mid-channel. He had no more than arrived at this conclusion when a sharp, startled movement that rocked the plains drew his attention to the man at his side. Glancing in alarm at the aviator's face, he saw it as white as marble, what little of it was visible beyond and beneath the wind mask. Thalicoon was holding out an arm and staring at it incredulously. Lanyard's gaze was drawn to the same spot, a ragged perforation in the sleeve of the pilot's leather sturdock, just above the elbow. "'What is it?' he inquired stupidly, again forgetting that he could not be heard. The eyes of the aviator, lifting from the perforation to meet Lanyard's stare, were clouded with consternation. Then Valaquin turned quickly and looked back. Simultaneously he ducked his head, and something slipped whining past Lanyard's cheek, touching his flesh with a touch more chill than that of the icy air itself. "'Damnation!' he shrieked, almost hysterically. "'That man-man in the Viker is firing at us!' End of chapter 25 Recording by Todd Chapter 26 of The Lone Wolf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lone Wolf by Louis Joseph Vance Chapter 26 The Flying Death Steadying himself with a splendid display of self-control and sheer courage, Captain Bellaquin concentrated upon the management of the biplane. The drone of its motor thickened again, its speed became greater, and the machine began to rise still higher, tracing a long, graceful curve. Lignard glanced apprehensively towards the girl, but apparently she remained unconscious of anything out of the ordinary. Her face was still turned forward, and still the wind veil trembled against her glowing cheeks. Thanks to the racket of the motor, no audible reports had accompanied the sharpshooting of the man in the monoplane, while Lanyard's cry of horror and dismay had been audible to himself exclusively. Hearing nothing, Lucy suspected nothing. Again, Lanyard looked back. Now the biker seemed to have crept up within a quarter of a mile of the biplane, and was boring on at a tremendous pace, its single spread of wings on an approximate level with that of the lower plane of the parrot. But this last was rising steadily. The driver's seat of the biker held a muffled, burly figure that might be anybody, de Motahan, Ekstrom, or any other homicidal maniac. At the distance his actions were as illegible as the results were unquestionable. Lanyard saw a little tongue of flame leak out from a point close beside the head of the figure. He couldn't distinguish the firearm itself. And like Valaquin, quite without premeditation, he ducked. At the same time there sounded a harsh, ripping noise immediately above his head, and he found himself staring up at a long, ragged tear in the canvas, caused by the bullet striking at a slant. "'What's to be done?' he screamed passionately at Valaquin. The aviator shook his head impatiently, and they continued to ascend. Already the web of gold that cloaked earth and sea seemed thrice as far beneath their feet as it had been when Vaquelin made the appalling discovery of his bullet-punctured sleeve. But the monoplane was doggedly following suit. As the parrot rose, so did the viker, if a trace more slowly and less flexibly. Lanyard had read somewhere, or heard it said, that monoplanes were poor machines for climbing. He told himself that, if this were true, Vaquelin knew his business, and from this reflection drew what comfort he might. And he was glad very glad, of the dark wind veil that shrouded his face, which he believed to be nothing less than a mask of panic terror. He was, in fact, quite rigid with fear and horror. It were idle to argue that only unlikely chance would win one of the bullets of the biker to a vital point. There was the torn canvas overhead, there was that hole through Vecklin's sleeve, and then the barograph on the strut beside Lanyard disappeared as if by magic. He was aware of a slight jar. The framework of the biplane quivered as from a heavy blow, something that resembled a handful of black crumbs sprayed out in the air ahead and it vanished, and where the instrument had been, nothing remained but an iron clamp gripping the strut. 
and even as any one of those bullets might have proved fatal, their first successor might disable the aviator if it did not slay him outright. In either case, the inevitable result would be death, following a fall from a height, as recorded by the barograph dial an instant before its destruction, of more than 4,000 feet. They were still climbing. Now the pursuer was losing some of the advantage in his superior speed. The parrot was perceptibly higher. The biker must needs mount in a more sweeping curve. Nonetheless, Lanyard, peering down, saw still another tongue of flame spit out at him, and two bullet holes appeared in the port side wings of the biplane, one in the lower, one in the upper spread of canvas. White limbed and trembling, the adventurer began to work at the fastenings of his surtout. After a moment, he plucked off one of his gloves and cast it impatiently from him. A sprawl, it sailed down the wind like a wounded sparrow. He caught Vaquilin's eye upon him, quick with a curiosity which changed to a sudden gleam of comprehension as Lanyard, thrusting his hand under the leather coat, groped for his pocket and produced an automatic pistol which de Croix had pressed upon his acceptance. They were now perhaps a hundred feet higher than the biker, which was soaring a quarter of a mile off to starboard. Under the guidance of the freshman, the parrot swooped round in a narrow circle till it hung almost immediately above the other, a maneuver requiring, first and last, something more than five minutes to effect. Meanwhile, Lanyard rebuttoned his soto and clutched the pistol, trying hard not to think, but already his imagination was sick with the thought of what would ensue when the time came for him to carry out his purpose. Vakwa then touched his arm with urgent pressure, but Lanyard only shook his head, gulped, and without looking surrendered the weapon to the aviator. Bearing heavily against the chest band, he commanded the broad white spread of the biker's back and wings. Invisible beneath these hung the motor and the driver's seat. An instant more, and he was aware that Vakwilin was leaning forward and looking down. Aiming with what deliberation was possible, the aviator emptied his clip of eight cartridges in less than a minute. The vicious reports rang out against the drum of the motor like the cracking of a black snake whip. Momentarily, Dunyard doubted if any one bullet had taken effect. He could not, with his swimming vision, detect sign of damage in the canvas of the biker. He saw the empty automatic slip from Wackelin's numb and nerveless hands. It vanished. A frightful fascination kept his gaze constant to the soaring biker. Beyond it, down, deep down a mile of emptiness, was that golden floor of tumbled cloud, waiting. He saw the monoplane check abruptly in its strong upward surge, as if it had run full tilt, head-on, against an invisible obstacle, and for what seemed a round minute it hung so, veering and wobbling, nuzzling the wind. Then, like a sounding wail, it turned and dived headlong, propeller spinning like a top. Down to the eighth of a mile of space it plunged plummet-like, then, perhaps caught in a flaw of wind, it turned sideways and began to revolve, at first slowly, but with increasing rapidity, in its fatally swift descent. Towards the beginning of its revolutions, something was thrown off, something small, dark, and sprawling, like that glove which Lanyard had discarded, but this object dropped with a speed even greater than that of the biker. In a brace of seconds had diminished to the proportions of a gnat, and another was engulfed in that vast sea of golden vapor. Even so, the monoplane itself, scarcely less precipitate, spun down through the abyss and plunged to oblivion in the fog rack. And the yard was still hanging against the chest band, limp and spent and trying not to vomit, when, of a sudden, and without any warning whatever, the Satorian chant of the motor ceased and was blotted up by that immense silence, by the terrible silence of those vast solitudes of the upper air, where never a sound is heard save the voices of the elements at war among themselves a silence that rang with an accent as dreadful as the crack of doom in the ears of those three suspended there, in the heart of that imaginably plesolate and immaculate radiance, in the vast hollow of the heavens, midway between the deep blue of the eternal dome and the rose and golden welter of the fog, that fog which, cloaking earth and sea, hid as well every vestige of the tragedy they had wrought, every sign of the murder that they had done, that they themselves might not be murdered and cast down to destruction." and its propeller no longer gripping the air, the aeroplane drifted on at ever-lessening speed, until it had no way whatever and rested without motion of any sort, as it might have been in the cup of some mighty and invisible hand, held up to that stark and merciless light, under the passionless eye of the infinite, to await a judgment. Then, with a little shudder of hesitation, the planes dipped, inclined slightly earthwards, and began slowly and as if reluctantly to slip down the long and empty channels of the air, at this, rousing, Lanyard became aware of his own voice yammering wildly at Vaquilin. "'Good God, man! Why did you do that?' Vaquilin answered only with a pale grimace and a barely perceptible shrug. Momentarily gathering momentum, the biplane sped downward with a resistless rush, with the speed of a great wind, a speed so great that when Lanyard again attempted speech, the breath was whipped from his lips and he could utter no sound. Thus, from that awful height, from the still heart of that immeasurable void, they swept down and ever down 
in a long series of sickening swoops, broken only by negligible pauses. And though they approached it on a long slant, the floor of vapor rose to meet them like a mighty rushing wave. In a trice, the biplane was hovering instantaneously before plunging on down into that cold, gray world of fog. In that moment of hesitation, while still the adventurer gasped for breath and pawed at his streaming eyes with an aching hand, pierced through and through with cold, the fog showed itself as something less substantial than it had seemed. Blurs of color glowed to its folds of gauze, and with these the rounded summit of a brownish knoll. Then they plunged on, down out of the bleak bright sunshine into cool twilight depths of clinging vapors, and the good green earth lifted its warm bosom to receive them. Tilting its nose a trifle, fluttering as though undecided, the parrot settled gracefully, with scarcely a jar, upon a wide sweep of untilled land covered with short coarse grass. For some time the three remained in their perches like petrified things, quite moveless, and with the possible exception of the aviator, hardly conscious. But presently, Lanyard became aware that he was regularly filling his lungs with air, sweet, damp, wholesome, and by comparison warm, and that the blood was tingling painfully in his half-frozen hands and feet. He sighed as one wakening from a strange dream. At the same time, the aviator restored himself, and began a bit stiffly to climb down. Feeling the earth beneath his feet, he took a step or two away from the machine, reeling and stumbling like a drunk man, then turned back. Come, my friend, he urged Lanyard in a voice of strangely normal intonation. Look alive, if you're able, and lend me a hand with that mademoiselle. I'm afraid she has fainted. The girl was reclining inertly in the bands of webbing, her eyes closed, her lips ajar, her limbs slackened. Small blame to her, Lanyard commented, fumbling clumsily with the chest band. That dye was enough to drive a body mad. But I had to do it, the aviator protested earnestly. I dared not remain longer up there. I have never before been afraid in the air, but after that I was terribly afraid. I could feel myself going, taking leave of my senses, and I knew I must act if we were not to follow that other. God, what a death! He paused, shuddered, and drew the back of his hand across his eyes before continuing. So I cut off the ignition and volplaned. Here, my hand. So, all right, eh? Oh, I'm all right, Lanyard insisted confidently. But his confidence was belied by a look of daze, for the earth was billowing and reeling round him as though bewitched, and before he knew what had happened he sat down hard and stared foolishly up at the aviator. Here, said the latter courteously, his wind mask hiding a smile, my hand again, monsieur. You've endured more than you know. And now for mademoiselle. But when they approached the girl, she surprised both by shivering, sitting up, and obviously pulling herself together. You'll feel better now, mademoiselle? Vaquelin inquired, hastening to loosen her fastenings. I'm better, yes, thank you, she admitted in a small, broken voice. But not yet quite myself. She gave a hand to the aviator, the other to Lanyard, and as they helped her to the ground, Lanyard, warned by his experience, stood by with a ready arm. She needed that support, and for a few minutes didn't even seem conscious of it. Then, gently disengaging, she moved a foot or two away. Where are we? Do you know? On the south down somewhere, Lanyard suggested, consulting Vaquelin. That is probable, this last affirmed. At all events, judging from the course I steered, somewhere well in from the coast at a venture, I don't hear the sea. Near Luz, perhaps? I have no reason to doubt that. A constraining pause ensued. The girl looked from the aviator to Lanyard, then turned away from both, and, trembling with fatigue and enforcing self-control by clenching her hands, stared aimlessly off into the mist. Painfully, Lanyard set himself to consider their position. The parrot had come to rest in what seemed to be a wide, shallow, saucer-like depression, whose irregular bounds were cloaked in fog. In this space no living thing stirred save themselves, and the waste was crossed by not so much as a sheep track. In brief, they were lost. There might be a road running past the saucer ten yards from its brim in any quarter. There might not. Possibly there was a town or village immediately adjacent. Quite as possibly, the downs billowed away for desolate miles on either hand. Well, what do we do now? the girl demanded suddenly, in a nervous voice, sharp and jarring. Oh, we'll find a way out of this somehow, Vaquilin asserted confidently. England isn't big enough for anybody to remain lost in it, not for long at any events. I'm sorry only on Miss Shannon's account. We'll manage somehow, Lanyard affirmed stoutly. The aviator smiled curiously. To begin with, he advanced, I dare say we might as well get rid of these awkward costumes. They'll hamper walking, rather. In spite of this fatigue, Lanyard was so struck by the circumstances that he couldn't help remarking it as he tore off his wind veil. Your English is remarkably good, Captain Velquillen, he observed. The other laughed shortly. Why not? said he, removing his mask. Lanyard looked up into his face, stared, 
and fell back a pace. Verthimer, he gasped. End of chapter 26. Recording by Todd. Chapter 27 of The Lone Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lone Wolf by Louis Joseph Vance. Daybreak. The Englishman smiled cheerfully in response to Lanyard's cry of astonishment. In effect, he observed, stripping off his gauntlets, "'You're right, Mr. Lanyard. Wertheimer isn't my name, but it is so closely identified with my, um, insinuative personality as to warrant the misapprehension. I shan't demand an apology so long as you permit me to preserve an incognito which may yet prove somewhat useful.' "'Incognito,' Lanyard stammered, utterly discountenanced. "'Useful!' you have my meaning exactly although my work in paris is now ended there's no saying when it may not be convenient to be able to go back without establishing a new identity before lanyard replied to this the look of wonder in his eyes yielded to one of understanding scotland yard eh he queried curtly wertheimer bowed special agent he added i might have guessed if i'd had the wit of a goose lanyard affirmed bitterly but i must admit yes the englishman assented pleasantly i did pull your leg didn't i but not more than our other friends of course it's taken some time i had to establish myself firmly as a shining light of the swell mob over here before de morbihan would take me to his hospitable bosom i presume i'm to consider myself under arrest with a laugh the englishman shook his head vigorously no thank you he declared i've had too convincing proof of your distaste for interference in your affairs you fight too sincerely mr lanyard and i'm a tired sleuth this very morning as ever was i would need a week's rest to fit me for the job of taking you into custody a week and some able-bodied assistance but he amended with a graver countenance i will say this if you're in england a week hence i'll be tempted to undertake the job on general principles i don't in the least question the sincerity of your intention to behave yourself hereafter but as a servant of the king it's my duty to advise you that england would prefer you to start life anew as they say in another country several steamers sail for the states before the end of the week further details i leave entirely to your discretion but go you must he concluded firmly i understand said lanyard and would have said more but couldn't there was something suspiciously like a mist before his eyes avoiding the faces of his sweetheart and the englishman he turned aside put forth a hand blindly to a wing of the biplane to steady himself and stood with head bowed and limbs trembling moving quietly to his side the girl took his other hand and held it tight presently lanyard shook himself impatiently and lifted his head again sorry he said apologetic but your generosity when i was looking for nothing better than a rest was a bit too much for my nerves nonsense the englishman commented with brusque good humour we're all upset a drop of brandy will do us no end of good unbuttoning his leather surtout he produced a flask from an inner pocket filled its metal cup and offered it to the girl you first if you please miss shannon no i insist you positively need it she allowed herself to be persuaded drank coughed gasped and returned the cup which wertheimer promptly refilled and passed to lanyard the raw spirit stung like fire but proved an instant aid to the badly jangled nerves of the adventurer in another moment he was much more himself drinking in turn wertheimer put away the flask that's better he commented now i'll be able to cut along with this blessed machine without fretting over the fate of ekstrom but till now i haven't been able to forget he paused and drew a hand across his eyes it was then ekstrom you think lanyard demanded unquestionably de morbihan had learned i know of your bargain with ducroy and i know too that he and ekstrom spent each morning in the hangars at st germain after your sensational evasion it never entered my head of course that they had any such insane scheme brewing as that else i would never have so giddily arranged with ducroy through the surete you understand to take vauquelin's place besides who else could it have been not de morbihan for he's crippled for life thanks to that affair in the bois not Papineau, who was on his way to the sante last i saw of him and never bannon he was dead before i left paris for port aviation dead oh quite the englishman affirmed nonchalantly when we arrested him at three this morning charged with complicity in the murder of roddy he flew into a passion that brought on a fatal hemorrhage he died within ten minutes there was a little silence i may tell you mr lanyard the englishman resumed looking up from the motor to which he was paying attentions with monkey wrench and oil can that you were quite off your bat when you ridiculed the idea of the international underworld unlimited of course if you hadn't laughed i shouldn't feel quite as much respect for you as i do in fact the chances are you'd be in handcuffs or in a cell of the sante this very minute 
But, absurd as it sounded, and was, the underworld project was a pet hobby of Bannon's, who'd been the brains of a gang of criminals in New York for many years. He was a bit touched on the subject, a monomaniac, if you ask me, and his enthusiasm won de Morbihan and Papineau over, and me. He took a wonderful fancy to me, Bannon did. I really was the appointed first lieutenant in Gregg's stead. So you first won my sympathy by laughing at my offer, said Warrenheimer, restoring the oil can to its place in the tool kit, wherein you were very wise. In fact, my personal feeling for you is one of growing esteem, if you'll permit me to say so. You've most of the makings of a man. Will you shake hands with a copper's nark? He gave Lanyard's hand a firm and friendly grasp and turned to the girl. "'Good-bye, Miss Shannon. I'm truly grateful for the assistance you gave us. Without you, we'd have been sadly handicapped. I understand you have sent in your resignation. It's too bad. The service will feel the loss of you. But I think you were right to leave us the circumstances considered. And now it's good-bye and good luck. I hope you may be happy. I'm sure you can't go far without coming across a high road or a village, but, for reasons not unconnected with my profession, I prefer to remain in ignorance of the way you go.' Releasing her hand, he stepped back, saluted the lovers with a smile and gay gesture, and clambered briskly into the pilot's seat of the biplane. When firmly established, he turned the switch of the starting mechanism. The heavy, distinctive hum of the great motor filled that isolated hollow in the downs like the purring of a dynamo. With a final wave of his hand, Wertheimer grasped the starting lever. Its brutal deepening, the parrot stirred, shot forward abruptly. In two seconds it was fifty yards distance, its silhouette already blurred, its wheels lifting from the rim of the hollow. Then lightly it leaped, soared, parted the mist, vanished. For some time Lanyard and Lucy Shannon remained motionless, clinging together hand in hand, listening to the drone that presently dwindled to a mere thread of sound and died out altogether in the obscurity above them. Then, turning, they faced each other, smiling a trace uncertainly, a smile that said, So all that is finished, or perhaps we dreamed it. Suddenly, with a low cry, the girl gave herself to Lanyard's arms, and as this happened the mist parted, and bright sunlight flooded the hollow in the downs. End of chapter 27 End of The Lone Wolf by Louis Joseph Vance